morning, everybody. Let's w- welcome the Avenue Worship Center, which joins us today uh, on the big screen. I mean, for the Avenue, life's lessons from the big screen really fits, don't you think? Because they get the message most of the time that way. Um, if you don't understand why, why we would preach and, and use movies as an example, I'd recommend the, the service from last weekend. I spent a little bit more time talking about it, and you could get one of those free in the lobby. They're available. We're going to pray, and I just want to instruct you a little bit before we pray. Uh, we're going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, and I'd like you to spend just the first, uh, just a little bit, um, praying for and thinking about lifting up uh, uh, Charleston, uh, the city, the families, the churches there. Uh, there's an incredible, incredible, uh, horrible atrocity that's occurred. If you don't know about it, uh, again, all you'd have to do is, is Google that and have way more information than anybody would ever want, but there's been an incredible act of uh, hatred, and uh, we need prayer, and we need to pray. The church needs to be found praying. Uh, I have a good friend, uh, Greg Surratt, who is the president of ARC, who pastors in that city. I've been in touch with him the last couple days, and uh, he says that there are amazing things. In spite of the horrible, terrible thing that was done, God is doing amazing things. Because we serve a God that can take maybe one of the worst acts that in a a very long time, in my lifetime, that I've heard of or seen. And God is actually using it to bring the city together. He's using it to give families an opportunity who suffered loss that is almost incomprehensible, the opportunity to, to, to walk in grace and love and forgiveness. And it is, uh, it's beyond what humans could do. God's at work in Charleston, and he needs to be. Uh, we all acknowledge that. He needs to be. So could we just have a moment here, and you in your own way, as you sit there, begin to pray, and, and then I'll jump in in a little bit, and we'll, we'll pray. Father, help your church. Lord, help us to remember that today's not the day to win an argument on Facebook. It's not a day to get our point across or be heard. It's a day to believe you for grace and comfort and mercy to be poured out on families that have been robbed in a, in a horrible way. Prayer for for a church that, that has been uh, attacked in, a, in, an, in another uh, also unthinkable way. God, for, for a city who the enemy has tried to rip apart, for the hearts of people who are crushed. Lord, may we be found not arguing our point, but may we be found crying out for life and grace and mercy and comfort for all those affected by this uh, horrible act. Give your church wisdom. May they move in, in a compassion and a grace that amazes those around. Continue to, because they have already. The families have been incredible. God, have your way there. What the enemy meant for evil God, you can turn for good. We also lift up the time we have together in the word, and we pray that we'd hear it and understand it, that it would seat in our heart as a, as a seed planted in fertile ground, and it would grow. That you would help me, Lord, as a, as a planter to, to plant the word, uh, to water the word, to, to see the word harvest in, in your people's lives. God, we honor you, we love you, we bless you in Jesus' name. Everybody that agree with that said, amen. amen. The movie Braveheart is, uh, was nominated for 10 Academy Awards. Uh, it won five of them. I believe the five that it won was Best Picture, Best Makeup, Best Cinematography, Best Sound Editing, and Best Director. Many of you know that Mel Gibson 
both uh, starred in it and directed it. Uh, Gibson portrays a man by the name of William Wallace, who was a 13th century in the 1200s, a Scottish warrior who won the first war of Scottish independence against King Edward I, and a very famous guy in Scotland. He's kind of their world hero. The, the movie was actually done based on a poem by Blind Harry. That's the guy who wrote the poem, and the poem was called The Acts and Deeds of the Illustrious and Valiant Champion, Sir William Wallace. Now, they talk differently over there. I was over there one time, and they taught me a little phrase. I'm going to share it with you. You can kind of guess what I'm saying, but it's, it's a bra brach mulch neck to neck. And it's like, okay, what was that? It's a, br it's a bright moonlit night tonight. And that's how they talk. And it's different, and it's cool. And William Wallace was awesome. I love that movie. I mean, war and blood and... Gu no, okay. Um, why do we like it? We like it because it's the underdog winning. It's the oppressed getting set free. It's because there's injustice, and instead of injustice winning out in the end, righteousness wins out in the end. And, and I think it's a movie loved by people, uh, uh, not only for the excellent, all the stuff about movies, but the message in it is, is an incredible message. Uh, uh, William Wallace, though, and the movie was not received with the same joy in Scotland that, that it's received here in America. In fact, uh, they kind of have a negative view about it. In fact, you, 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 uh, there's a, a real memorial there to William Wallace and uh, the Bruce as well. And uh, in that memorial, somebody, a famous sculptor, made a huge statue of Braveheart, and they brought it and presented it to him and gave it to him. Well, the problem was they made it look like Mel Gibson. And they wrote Braveheart on the shield. Well, most people don't know this, but... Actually, in Scottish lore and history, Braveheart is actually the Bruce and not William Wallace. So that's just a little bit of an incorrect thing. And I just want to read you a quote by one of the, one of the residents of the town where this is at. And again, this is, these aren't my words. This is someone else's quote. It says that one local resident stated that it was wrong to desecrate the main memorial to Wallace with a giant lump of crap. <laughs> I'm just reading a quote here. Uh, they hated it so much that someone took a hammer and beat the face off of it. They fixed the face and then put it in a cage. And then they hated it because it looked like William Wallace was in a cage. And so I think they dumped it in the Irish Sea and moved on from there. So it's not there anymore. But, but the truth is it's an epic film that's amazing. It's such an epic film that it took two full VHS tapes to contain it. For those of you that are a little bit older, in 1995, we were plugging in a tape. We get halfway through the movie, and we took it out and plugged in another one. Uh, we don't live that way anymore, thank God. Uh, the other thing about it, it won one other award that people aren't familiar with, but one of the awards it won was the second most unhistorical movie of all time. It, it, I mean, William Wallace is real, the Bruce is real, but from there it gets really, sh really shaky from there. Uh, a couple of things that are different, the, the blue... Uh, paint that they would put on their faces. It was called woad, and they put that on their faces. They stopped using that about in the year 200. So this is in the 1200s. A little bit historical inaccurate. And the kilts that they wore, they didn't start wearing those until the 1700s. So 500 years later before they actually started wearing kilts, and 1,000 years before that, they stopped wearing the blue stuff on their face. So, and it's just the beginning of the errors in the movie that way. But the movie is incredible. Why? Because the oppressed go free. The underdog wins. Somebody who doesn't look like they should make it, makes it. Here's the, here's the truth. In the story of William Wallace, it took an issue of the heart for him to rise up and do something. What do I mean? Well, when he moved there, what he said, when he came back to the area, his father was one of the nobles in the area, and he was killed by the king, and he went away with his uncle Argyle, and he learned all this stuff. He came back, and he came back, they said, what are you here for? He said, look, I just want to raise crops and a family. He wasn't there to do something great. He wasn't there to accomplish a great feat. He came back to uh, marry the girl of his dreams and to raise a family and to live his life. It took an issue of the heart for him to do what he did. And what happened, of course, was this incredibly uh, uh, crazy law that they had 
which is debatable whether that law ever existed in real historical fact, but the law that, that was said to be in place at the time was that on the wedding night of a Scottish uh, uh, groom and his bride, that on their, on their wedding night, that the English lord that was in charge of the area would take her to his bed and then return her the next day. And so William Wallace uh, wasn't up for that, and so he uh, married secretly. And when he found out that he'd married his wife secretly, the, he killed, the English Lord killed his wife. Took an issue of the heart for William Wallace to do what he did. I, I, I had to start asking some questions at that point. I want to ask you, because I, I was asking myself as well. What's it take? To move my heart. What has to happen? I wrote this message two weeks ago. I had no idea this past week would occur and what happened in the world today. The truth of the matter is if your heart can't be moved by, by what happened in Charleston, you need to cry out to God. But what's it take to move our hearts? What's it take to move my heart? I also had to ask the question of, are there, are there things or people that my heart is automatically hard to? I don't even give it a chance. I mean, it could be, it could be something silly. It could be the way someone dresses. That because someone dresses a certain way, they're out with us. Say, well, you know, is that possible in the world we live in? Yeah, I think it is. I've seen, I've seen these things in the church. I'm not talking about things I see in the world. I'm talking about things I see in the church. I'm not thinking of anybody in particular by any means. But, but just as an example, I've seen that if, if, if a young lady dresses provocatively, that instead of someone, uh, another lady having compassion for her, she has disdain. The question is, why does she dress provocatively? And what is going on in her heart? And what could God possibly want to do with you and through you to help? It could be, here's, here's another silly one I see in the church right now, tattoos. There's still people that look at tattoos and go have an attitude about them. I just want to say, in the day and age we live in, you better get used to it. Because a tattoo is about like a t-shirt right now. <laughs> you wear a t-shirt, good for you. You got a tattoo, good for you. Let's move on. And I, I added in my notes, and, and today it's very apropos, but is it race? Is there anybody that God made on this blue marble any group of people anywhere that your heart is close to because they're different? Ask God to grant you repentance. You know, there's, a, there's an amazing post on uh, the young man who committed this atrocities uh, Facebook page. Uh, Man, my mind just went blank. Marcus, is it, uh, what's his name? Is it Marcus Stanley? He's a gospel musician. And it was before the young man was c captured. And this gospel musician, who didn't live for the Lord for a long time in his life. Uh, before that, he was all sorts of kinds of musician and living a wild and crazy life. He was walking to the store uh, to get something at the store late at night. And a couple of guys in a gang uh, shot him. With a 45 caliber pistol, he fell to the ground, shot him seven more times at point blank range. And he lived. He said, while he was laying there on the ground, he saw this angel, a transparent angel standing there. He wasn't a Christian. He said, well, I saw this transparent figure in between me and the gun as they were shooting. He said, I saw it again in the hospital room. He still didn't serve God for five more years, but after five more years, he finally thought, I give. Oh, dude, come on, give me a break. <laughs> I mean, the guy's six seven. I think that might have helped him with absorbing eight rounds of forty-five caliber, you know, whatever. 
These guys killed him as a gang, or tried to kill him as a gang initiation. This guy wrote on this young man's website, look, I don't hate you, I love you, and I'm for you, but better than that, God loves you. Since you haven't been caught yet, there's a slight chance you might see this. You do need to turn yourself in, but more important even than that is you need to do this. You need to give your heart and life to Christ. And he led him in a, in a salvation prayer on his website. And of course, he was a young man of color, Marcus, who got shot eight times. Incredible. Incredible. Is there, if you hear that, and I don't know what you think of people or, or what quality of of character it would take to respond to something like that in that way. And then to think because somebody's a different color, they're less than you. I see people doing more than I've ever dreamed of doing in the same circumstance after this travesty, this tragedy. What's it take to move our hearts? And is there someone that our hearts just naturally close to? Here's the truth in, in his Facebook post. He said, nobody's born with hate for anybody in their heart. We're all born colorblind, which is both a physical fact and a natural fact as well. Somebody has to teach you to hate. It's time to learn another lesson. What about socioeconomic status? You know, I know some people are down on the poor, and I get that, but I've, I've actually seen in the church more people are mad at the rich. They got an attitude of, against people with money. Not me, I love you. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm joking here. The other thing, you know, political opposite. You know, it's amazing that if somebody has a different political view than us or a different ideology, they think differently than us, that we're, we're willing to throw them out and say they got what they deserved. Isn't that incredible? I think it's possible to disagree with somebody and still be compassionate. Say, so how do you know about all these things? Because I had to check my own heart on all this stuff. See, what do we allow to move our hearts? I'm going to just say it has to be God. Because here's the deal. There's too much going on in the world to just spend your whole life in a, in a, in a, in a wet, weeping ball in the corner. Because here's the truth. If we just took, and you take any amount, just a, a, a wild number, if you took five square miles around this church, and if you knew everything that went on in those five square miles, it would overwhelm you, you couldn't take it. God knows. But I believe that he brings to us things that move our hearts so that we can do something about them. So we need to be moved by God. We need to make sure that we're allowing God to move our hearts in the situations in the world. And I'll just give you a quick example out there. And, and please, don't get down on me because I'm in a different... See, if I have a different ideology or think a little different than you, remember, you're supposed to still love me, all right? Okay, just remember that part as I talk about this part. But there's a commercial on TV about like, you know, animals and it's got like this incredibly sad music and puppies that are crying and stuff. Chris laughs. Uh, and uh, it's manipulation. It, I'm gonna say that again, it's manipulation. It's just trying to manipulate money out of people. Now, are we supposed to take care of animals? Absolutely, the Bible actually has scripture in it that, that a godly man takes care of an animal. And an ungodly man abuses an animal. Yes, we said, our dogs eat better than I do, those stinking little weasels. <laughs> take care of them. And if they chew up one more thing in my house, I'm going to take care of them. <laughs> I came in the other day, my, one of my gun cases, they, the dog, the little, the new one took all the foam out of it, chewed it up, and there were pieces of that all over the house. It actually looked like dog poop at first, so it made me really nervous. Because it's dark gray, brown, you know, foam. And I thought, like, the dog just pooped about 40 pounds all over our house. <laughs> Set me free, Jesus. Okay. I got to get on with this. I believe our hearts need to be soft. And we got to be careful. We don't let things harden our hearts. Hebrews 3, 7 through 8 say, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of the trial in the wilderness. Two things about that real quick. It says, if you will, verse 7 says, if you will, not if you do, hear his voice. 
if you will hear his voice, not if you do. Why does it say it that way? Because I think you have to want to hear God's voice. You have to want to. You've got to kind of listen for it. And then when you do, make sure you say yes and then act on it. Because if you don't, your heart will become hard. When God speaks and you go, I'll get it later. God speaks, 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 doesn't seem like you can hear him anymore. Stop saying later and start saying, yes, Lord. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, yes, Lord. See, important point. Trying to hear the voice of God and not reading your Bible is like expecting a call with your phone turned off. One more time. Trying to hear from God and not reading your Bible is like expecting a call with your phone turned off. It's foolish. Don't do it. Get into your Bible. Read it. If you want to hear God speak, you can do it all day long. Read it. It's there. Let's go to a story uh, in the Bible, which I think is incredibly uh, Cool story. It's kind of obscure. You might have never heard it before. But it's a story. Unlikely hero, Saul. Not Saul in the New Testament. Saul in the Old Testament. Who was the king of Israel and ended up really bad. I mean, he ended up really struggling. He tries to kill David several times. He ends up committing suicide on the battlefield. Dies in shame and infamy. It's not a good thing at all. It's a bad, he dies a bad death and, and lives, his life is really bad at the end, but he didn't start that way. In fact, he comes into Israel's history at a time when Israel was wanting something to happen. They came to Samuel, who was the prophet at the time. They said to Samuel, Samuel, we want a king. We want to be like every other nation around us. They have a king, and the king goes, fights the battles, and the king tells us what to do, and the king is doing all this stuff. We want a king. You know, they got a king, and they got a king, and they got a king. You know, the Philistines, the Ammonites, the Uptites, the Outsites. The cellulites, the Jebus, they all got a king, all right? And we want a king too. And Samuel says, you don't need a king. God's your king. And uh, they say, oh, we really want a king. And Samuel goes to God and goes, God, I don't know what to do. They want a king. And God said to Samuel, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Give them a king. He says, but tell them when you give them a king that the king is going to take their sons and put them to work for them. And cause him to go out and to fight his battles. He's going to take their daughters. And they're going to serve him. He's going to take their best land and their best flocks. And uh, it's not going to be easy when they have a king. Tell them, warn them that, but then give them a king. And so they, they find this king. And this king happens to be, listen to this, 1 Samuel 9. We're going to go to verse 2. Could we jump to verse 2? Sorry I'm jumping around here, but verse 2 if we could. Uh, this is about Saul. He, this guy, this Benjamite guy, uh, he had a son named Saul, <clears throat> an impressive young man without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than any of the others. His name was Brian Moore. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> now, it was, it was Saul. And here's the thing. Saul looked apart, <clears throat> but did he have the heart? Brian Moore does. But... We're not so sure about Saul, but when you begin to look at his life, you see some amazing things about Saul. You see Saul, uh, when he first comes on the scene, he's out looking for his father's donkeys. That means he's obedient. He's doing what his dad wants. He's doing something that's important to his family. When he can't find the donkeys, he says, uh, I hear there's a prophet around here somewhere. Let's go ask him. So that means he's spiritual and acknowledges that God's at work in the earth and has people around that, that represent him. And so he said, let's go to the God representative in the area and find out. And that's what they did. And they went to Samuel and said, hey, do you know where my dad's donkeys are? And he said, look, the donkeys are found, found but God spoke to him and said, here's your king. So Saul began to talk to him and told him some things to do, which he continued to do, everything he was told by Samuel. And then it says in verse uh, uh, 9 of chapter 10, 1 Samuel 10, 9, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. And all these signs were fulfilled that day. Another, another verse about him says, and he became another man. So we've got this guy, Saul, who gets inaugurated as king. He's so humble that when they're inaugurating him, or he's fearful, one of the two, he hides 
and doesn't even want to come out when they say, and here he is, Mr. Tall Guy, Saul. He's like, which is hard to hide when you're as big as Brian Moore. But anyway, moving right along. <clears throat> what does he do after he's, he's, he's made king of all of Israel? He goes home and goes back to work on his father's farm. I think that's incredible. I mean, he doesn't build a castle. He doesn't say, okay, now the taxes are. Or he doesn't come up with, which there's a whole message in there about if you're going to be something for God and do something for God, let God do it and don't do it yourself. Let God make the rules and you don't make the rules. But anyway, he goes home and he begins to work on his dad's farm. And then something, uh, something happens. And this is found in 1 Samuel 11. And I'll just tell you the story quickly. Uh, this, this little town, Jabesh Gilead, which was a little town on the fringe of Israel's territory. In other words, when it was time to come in and take the promised land, a lot of people came in to fight the giants and take the land. But Jabesh Gilead said, you know what, we like it over here on the edge. We, we don't like fighting giants. We're just going to stay over here and camp out. You guys go in there and fight. We'll be over here if you need something. Let us know. And so they stayed over there on the edge. Here's the problem. When you live on the edge like they did, they almost got attacked all the time. It's better to get in in the center. Come on. If you're on the fringe of the church, come on in. The water's fine. And so there they are out on the fringe, and, and they, uh, they get attacked by this guy Nahash. Nahash the Ammonite. And uh, he's, he's a bad guy. What he says to them is he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take over your city. And they said, okay, look, nobody has to die here. We will come out and give up. And we'll serve you. We'll become your servants. And Nahash says, mm, okay, on one condition. I gouge out everybody's right eye. Because I want to I wanna shame Israel. Which means he wanted to shame God. Look, say your God is small. And they said, well, we want to think about it for seven days. And they sent out messengers to see if anybody would help them. And the message came to the town that Saul lived in, but Saul was out working in the field, so he didn't hear the message. When he came back in from working in the field, he saw everybody weeping. He said, why is everyone weeping? What's going on? And they told him about what the situation was. And the Bible says that the Spirit of God came upon him in power and he burned with anger and he took his oxen, the two oxen he was working with, and he cut them up in pieces about this big. And he put each piece on a cart and sent it to the, the four corners of Israel. And he says, unless you want your ox to look like this, get over here and let's fight. We're going to go fight Naash. Naash, by the way, his name means to hiss like a snake. Interesting, huh? And so Saul goes and he fights with them and he delivers them and he beats them. See, Saul didn't hear the news and just go, oh, okay, that's not good. And I want to tell you what I find in this story, what I can learn from this story. Number one, the first thing I learn is compassion has action. See, sympathy is good. Sympathy is in the Bible. The Bible says rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Sympathy feels it. Sympathy weeps. Sympathy thinks of not just yourself but others. But compassion goes further. Compassion acts. It does something. This is what it says in Matthew 14, 14. Jesus is our example for this. When Jesus went out and saw a great multitude, he was moved. What's it say? He, he didn't feel compassion. He was moved with compassion because compassion has action for them. And he did something. He healed their sick. Compassion just doesn't go, oh, man, I'm so sorry you don't feel well. It does something about it. Number one. Number two. That even if people are in trouble because of their own choices, they still need help. See, J. Bash Gilead living out there on the fringe. They could have just said, you know, if the dudes would have come in like they were supposed to. If they just moved from out there on the edge and quit flirting with the disaster. If they quit making the choice to do it that way and they start doing it this way, they wouldn't be in trouble anymore. They can just, you know, they made their bed. They can lie in it. Yet Saul came to their aid anyway. You know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of me. 
And that reminds me of you. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were in our own mess and it was our own fault. Yet Jesus came and rescued us. Come on. You know, uh, Overlook Ministry, the ministry that we have ministering to homeless men, most of the time it's homeless men. Uh, they help people on the fringe of society, and many of them are there because of their own choices. But they still help them. And it's godly. We can learn, number three, if God moves in your heart to help them, you should help them. Quit, quit making excuses and quit asking questions. Do what Saul did when Saul heard of their words. The Spirit of God came upon him in power. Look, I'm not encouraging you to help people do the wrong thing. Uh, I'm not encouraging you to develop a, a codependent relationship with somebody where you make it possible for them to continue to do the wrong thing again and again and again. That's not what I'm saying. That's not the help they need. See, the Bible says that if anybody asks you for help, you should give it. Let me read to you. It says, in Matthew 5, 42, Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. But here's the truth. Just because someone asks you for something, that doesn't mean you have to give them what they ask for. You can give them what they need instead. You know, I had experience. I'd just become pastor of the church 20-some years ago, and Walked out front after Wednesday night service and a bunch of people around and a guy rode up on a bike and he picked me to ask and he said, hey, you know, I'm hungry. Is there any way you could buy me some food? And I said, brother, I would be happy to. Let's throw your bike in the back of my truck. I'll take you up to Denny's and wherever you want to go, we'll buy you dinner. And he said, you know, I could get so much more if we went to the grocery store, if, if I could just take money and buy groceries. I said, no problem, we'll go to the grocery store. I'll push the basket, you can put in that basket anything you want, and then I'll pay for it. And he said, uh, you know, that's kind of, that, that's embarrassing to have you go shopping for me. I said, no problem, you put it in, uh, then you go outside, you wait around the corner, I'll pay for it and I'll bring it out to you very privately. And he said, yeah, but, and I said, no, yeah, buts anymore. The truth is you don't want food. You want something else. And we'll help you. We want to help you. But we don't want to help you into more trouble than you're already in already. Just because someone asks you for help and the Bible says you should give them help doesn't mean you always give them what they ask for. See, the Bible says that we're to bring the gospel to the poor. And we have a food pantry and we, we feed the hungry here. But here's the truth. That in, in doing our, a food pantry like we do, we have to feed the greedy to feed the needy. We get people pull up. I've, I've seen people pull up in a BMW on their cell phone going to get food. Now, I, I don't know what the situation is. That car may be, you know, 10 months behind in payment, and they're looking for it. That phone may be getting ready to shut off. I don't know, so I can't say, hey, you don't get any. The truth is, though, we have to give it to everybody so that we can get it to the right people. Because if I'm going to make a mistake and stand before Jesus, I want to make a mistake for, for, for giving it to the wrong person rather than not giving it to the right person. Let's err on the side of mercy, right? Lastly, uh, we have to learn that we have to maintain a heart of compassion. What do you mean? Well, I mean... Saul ended up in a miserable place. Here was a guy that was easily moved by the Spirit of God who did a mighty work to deliver this town called Jab Jabesh Gilead and he ended up committing suicide on the battlefield overwhelmed by the enemy. The Bible tells us that the enemy after Saul was defeated and his son Jonathan took their bodies to their city and stuck them on stakes on the wall just to brag about their defeat, their, the, the, Israel's defeat. You know what the Bible tells us? That a group of men from Jabesh Gilead got together at night and snuck over to that city and stole Saul's body and his son's body down off the wall and took them and gave them a proper burial. Why? Because they were people who remembered Saul when his heart was tender to God. I believe God's goal for us is to have a tender heart to be people that 
have a brave heart. Bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. The Bible says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. One of the crazy things about our society and the way we think, and this really convicted me, is that when the English thug that killed William Wallace's wife died, I cheered. I get it. That's the way movies are designed. It worked. I jumped up and, yeah! In fact, in The Wizard of Oz, what do we do? We sing, ding dong, the witch is dead. We have a little party and sing a song about it. But the truth is, God doesn't rejoice in the death of the wicked. Why? Because he'd rather see him saved. I believe that we need to stand up for injustice, but we should get no joy out of destroying somebody else. So how do we keep our hearts from getting hard? I believe the number one way we do it is by saying yes to God. In fact, I believe we need to make up our minds that whatever he says to us, the answer is going to be yes, even before he says it. I'm going to say that one more time. I believe that we need to make up our minds that whatever he says to us, the answer is yes, even before he says it. Which is kind of scary because, you know, you think, oh, I'll be a missionary to Africa. Oh, my gosh. But, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought, this is salvation. This is what happened when I was born again. Here I am, living my life, making my choices, doing my thing, and I felt like God said, you can have my life, but here's the deal, you got to give me yours. And I got to the point where I said, no matter what, from this day forward, Jesus, it's yes to you. And that's when I got saved. It's really a pretty good definition of lordship. Who's your Lord? Whoever you say yes to, whenever they say anything. So if you're here today, heads bowed and eyes closed, please, for a moment. And you say, Avenue, this includes you, Parkway here. You're here and say, I want to start saying yes to God. Because I've said yes to me for so long and it's put me in a mess. I want to give my heart and life to Jesus. I need what you're talking about today. And that's you. You say, I want to say yes. Just take your hand and raise it above your head. Anybody in the room, say, that's me. God bless you. Lots of folks putting up your hands. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You can put it up high and after you do, you can put it back down. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can I get the prayer counselors to come to the front, if you would, prayer counselors? Prayer team, thank you for moving this way. As they come to the front, uh, I want to lead you in a prayer. <clears throat> this is for everybody that raised their hand and maybe if you wanted to but didn't yet. It's just prayer simply talking to God. That's what we're going to do. Repeat this after me. Say, Father God, everybody in the room, Father God, Father God I want to say yes to you. I want to say yes to your Lordship. I want to say yes to your plan. I want to stop saying yes to me. I want to say yes that you are the Lord of my life. I want to live for you from this day forward. My answer to Jesus is yes. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Somebody give him give a, give a hand.